Hello, Working Preachers. This is Matt Skinner with a special announcement. Our spring fundraising campaign is off to a good start, but we could really use your help to reach our goal. For all of the difficulties and discouragements that can come from the preaching life, I'm reminded through this ministry that people love this work. Preaching brings joy, not just in the preaching moment and preparations, but in knowing that you're not in it alone. Here at Working Preacher, you can find a community of inspiration, interpretation, and imagination to help you engage with the Bible through diverse perspectives from a diverse range of interpreters who all reside in different social locations and some of whom have different theological hunches. We rely on the generosity of donors like you to carry out Working Preacher's ministry, and I hope we can rely on your support this May. And don't forget, after you make a gift to our spring campaign, we will send you an ebook from Working Preacher titled Sustaining the Preaching Life. It's a short ebook which echoes the theme of this year's Festival of Homiletics, which is happening this week in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And a shout out to all of you who are attending the festival. The ebook includes articles and commentaries curated by the Working Preacher team, meant to help preachers relearn ways to care for themselves and to discover new habits to support the preaching life. It's exclusively available to those who donate to the Working Preacher Spring Campaign before May 31st. Even if you're not a preacher, you can share it with a preacher whom you care about. I think you're really going to enjoy it. So go to workingpreacher.org today to make your gift securely online before May 31st. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. This year, the day of Pentecost falls on May 19th, 2024, and the texts are Acts 2, 1 through 21, Psalm 104, 24 to 34, and 35b for good measure, Romans 8, 22 to 27, and John 15, 26 through 27, and then 16, 4b through 15. Well, that there was, are some that, bangers. Well, yes. Some bangers I, this year. But that was quite the dramatic pause there, Matt, right before Acts. What could it be? What, what could, could it be? It be? What, text, what text is it? What so story fun. is it going to be? So fun. Yeah. It is not Ananias and Sapphira or the Seven Sons of Sceva. I was on pins and needles. Where <laughs> well, you were going to go? For a change. For well, this is why. <laughs> no offense to John and those who love John, but the reason we call it Pentecost as a Christian holiday is because of the Book of Acts. I know. I know. It's all because true. we all know that's the only story that actually refers to Pentecost as the giving of the Spirit Day, the fiftieth day of Easter. Also, today is the last or Sunday. The nineteenth is the final Sunday of Easter Tide. Yes. Yes. Shifting our time of the year. Get that going for you. Yeah. So change the pyramids to red and then change them back to white next week for Trinity, Trinity Sunday. And then we that's go green. That's a lot of, uh, yeah. pyramid. A lot of work. Do you see how I'm pushing here to do acts before John? Yes, I yeah. am. And I was going to say, let's do it. Let's mix it up. Every year. This is the text. Every year. <laughs> it's a good text. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I think, well, I should I shouldn't even presume to begin. One one of you two begin. No, go ahead. Please. Go for it. I've, I've written and spoken on this text so many times. I don't know. What You're else just I have a to say. little excited about it, Matt. You go for it. I am. This is the last Acts text for some time. So, uh, yeah, you know, this is uh, the beginning of a very long chapter. It's the it's the exciting part with all of the noises and sights and miraculous events. And then there's a long sermon that's a little bit meandering and difficult to follow sometimes. But then it also concludes with this lovely community community summary, or I should say a summary of community life that I think you is all, it's all part of Pentecost. It's all stuff that the Spirit inspires. And all of this, as Acts couches it, is part of the grand drama of Jesus, born, ministering, crucified, risen, ascended, and now the one who pours out the Spirit. And so this is, the coming of the Spirit is, among other things, a demonstration that Jesus is Lord. And it's worth remembering that before we jump ahead into what does the Spirit help me do? And what does the Spirit make for us? And what does the Spirit make possible? That first and foremost, the sheer arrival of the Spirit bears witness 
Two, not just an ascended Jesus who's now perfect and shiny, but the same Christ who was resurrected, the same Christ who bears the wounds, the same Christ who left in a body is now Lord of all. And we talked about that a little bit when we were poking around Ascension Day previously. Mm -hmm. But to start there, that one of the things the Spirit signifies or announces is where Christ is now and what Christ is now um, endowed with, empowered to do and to be. That's all I got. We can move on now. <laughs> yeah, right. I am really sure you're going to have more to say about that. Uh, I, I really appreciate a it. I, got a few, I have a few notes. I just a few, a few notes. Just a few, <laughs> yeah, like a book length worth of notes. Go ahead. Everybody's um, heard my shtick. You go. <laughs> well, I've I've said this before, and uh, I really appreciate um, the uh, significance of beginning with this is about Jesus. Um, and so uh, I, I do want to turn to that reminder that this was a Jewish holiday that folks gathered for on a regular basis. And the significance of it is that um, the Jews were scattered um, the diaspora of Jews, they were scattered uh, into all kinds of um, nations, ethnic, ethnic groups, cultural uh, differences. And so they came together for this holiday. They came together to celebrate what was a uh, Jewish uh, gathering. Uh, and so they were all there together in one place, um, as the text begins, and they began to hear of the works of Jesus and what God was doing in Jesus in a language that they understood. And that becomes significant because so often when we think of the tongues uh, of Pentecost, we think of that as a, a, a spiritual experience of unknown tongues. But what was absolutely incredible here is that from those who spoke a myriad of languages, they heard these Galilean fishermen speaking their language clearly, but what they learned of was the life and teachings of Jesus Christ that would become the unifying mark of the new community that we call church. So we call it the birthday of the church. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I, I do really appreciate you starting with Jesus and as you emphasized, Joy, that uh, I uh, not to look ahead to Holy Trinity Sunday, but we do tend to compartmentalize the, I, I think, the persons of the Trinity mm -hmm. and uh, and the way in which, and the way in which I think a preacher can on on Pentecost Sunday, make that connection. It seems really obvious, but I don't. I'm not sure that it is to people that what, as you said, Joy, what what the Pentecost what Pentecost Sunday is giving witness to is is what Jesus has done in Jesus' death and resurrection, and uh, and and so the that connection I think with um, particularly you know the first part of Acts is is really important, and then as we imagine too. I know we're leaving Acts, sadly, uh, Matt. I'm sorry about that. But, uh, but as we imagine, you know, Acts going forward, uh, it, it, it's it, it's it's what you know what the gospel is going to look like uh, fulfilled. What, what is one Acts one eight going to look like fulfilled? And um, because of that good news. And so the, the, the continuation or the continuity or the expressions of God even uh, as something to think about for Pentecost is important. And, you know, you also look at there came from heaven and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like a rush of a violent wind. And so there's allusions here to a theophany uh, right in terms of from heaven and a wind like the wind in the Genesis, and so you have these, uh, you have these theophanic. Is that a word? Good. That's good. Ooh, nice uh, theophan. <laughs> theophanic references or allusions that that point to uh, the, the way in which the, the way in which Pentecost is this. Uh, 
is really this uh, Sunday where we recognize the, you know, God's expression in God's fullness. Uh, and so that could be a different way also to think about the spirit rather than, you know, compartmentalize the spirit out and say, well, this is what the spirit does for us. Yeah, that's, uh, I think that's really important to, to bring up some of those old theophanic uh, images and, and phenomena here. If you want to start a fight, if you're ever in a bar with a bunch of Old Testament scholars and New Testament scholars, just ask, was the Holy Spirit present in the Old Testament and watch what happens? Um, because Old Testament scholars will all say no. Right. <laughs> like, the Spirit of the Lord is different. And then you say, well, how? And then you've got New Testament texts that actually credit the Holy Spirit with doing things in the Old Testament. Right. So right. it's kind of a yes and no answer is the right answer there. But it's it's always fun. But it gets I, I bring it up because it pushes the question, what was the Holy Spirit to these people? Mm. So when Peter stands up and says... Uh, you know, what's going on here is what Joel promised. And here he talks about the spirit of the Lord or, or my spirit, God's spirit. But the text talks about they're all filled with the Holy Spirit. Like, what does that even mean to them? Jesus has mentioned the Holy Spirit. But that's a new expression. That's mm -hmm. a new term. And even to use the word holy there is a little bit chilling that, mm -hmm. that, that a Holy Spirit would actually indwell ordinary folks mm -hmm. and not just the priest, you know, in the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur or something like that. Like this is a dramatic boundary incursion right up there with the baptism of Jesus in the synoptic tradition. This is, this is why when Cornelius, look at me jumping ahead in chapter 10 receives the Holy spirit, everybody just says, we're done here. God's, up to God's own spirit, a Holy spirit is now present in these people and in this household that that's just a, it's so you, just to not, because I think in the Christian church, we've got kind of the Holy Spirit as our buddy, you know, kind of the Holy Spirit as the gift giver. And, you know, in a way that's true, of course, not the buddy part, but the um, we've domesticated the spirit and lost that sense of awe and terror and just, are you kidding me, that I think Pentecost implies when the spirit shows up without regard, right, and fills everybody well, especially acts, uh, right? Yes. And 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 the the reference, as I mentioned earlier, in suddenly from heaven, you know, the rush right. of a violent wind, and so, like you said, this this infiltration, right? This yeah. uh, of of the spirit, and and into and then and you you have the reference. They were all together in one place, and so. You also have this sense of, as you said, Matt, this, the Holy Spirit breaking into boundaries in 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 not calm and and expected ways of very uh, very un well in many ways unexpected and almost even terrifying. Yes, and uh, and then to maybe put people in that homiletical space of, yeah, what am I going to do with this? Holy Spirit that's just showed up with wind and you know and uh, and and tongues of fire and uh, and and how do we how do we even imagine a Holy Spirit like that? I mean, it reminds me of this one. Uh, it was, I think it was on Twitter. Uh, and I think I, I don't see that very often because I'm not on Twitter anymore, but Unvirtuous Abby, who had all these photos of different birds, uh, the Holy Spirit when you do this or the Holy Spirit when you do that. And it was great because it was just these ca capturing of these different birds that were supposed to be the spirit. And sometimes they were just like these little birds sitting on a branch and, you know, and being all calm and nice. And some, and sometimes it was like these dive bomb birds that were just coming down. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is going to like, you know, slap you outside the head. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's what it reminds me of too. How, yeah, I, I really love that. How do we recover that, that awe, that terror um, with this familiar uh, scene? One of, one of my students preached a sermon that um, sticks with me um, um, because uh, and 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 I I remember it this time because in some ways it embodies that God the Father God the Son God the Spirit idea. Um, he, he describes Pentecost as third place of Christian holidays. 
you know, we have Christmas, the incarnation, we have Easter, the resurrection, and we have Pentecost. Everybody knows Christmas and Easter. Oh, yeah. And then there's Pentecost, but we don't know Pentecost the way we know the other two. And um, in some ways that, what what is this third identity? And for uh, those who would be first experiencing this sermon, this uh, meandering sermon, uh, or reading this uh, account, um, would would be echoes from um, the presence of God in fire, um, the presence of God that um, was uh, the burning bush that uh, that spoke to Moses, the presence of God that was the fire that journeyed with them through the wilderness, the that 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 this image of fire already has some um, echoes of the presence of God showing up and catching people's attention. And if we can do that again, um, I, I know some of my Methodist colleagues would be surprised if the Spirit of God descended in a noticeable way. Um, I don't think you'll get mad at me if I say some of our Presbyterian or Lutheran colleagues might even be more shocked uh, if if the spirit showed up in an undeniable way, but what would we do? How would we respond? Um, or or maybe I should ask: When was the last time that you gathered together in one place for one reason, and God showed up in a way that totally rewrote the script and changed the plans and set you in a direction that said? I didn't see this coming, but I'm definitely going to follow this train for wh- however long it's on this track. So every now and then we uh, we invite people to write for Working Preacher, and we occasionally we hook like a luminary, somebody who's just outstanding in their field, and we always are like, I can't believe they agreed to write for us. And so, uh, yeah, we've got uh, a commentary on John 15 and 16 from from one Caroline Lewis. Yeah, wow, we got that. I know, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> what do you think of it, Joy? Did you like the commentary? I did. You know, it, it's always exciting to read something from Caroline Lewis. In fact, I love hearing from her too. Oh, well, uh, <laughs> I'd like to hear from you too about what, yeah. Well, I, as I note in the, uh, in my commentary, I kind of went with this, um, this idea of the spirit being the first responder, uh, and kind of taking that and and looking at uh, because it's you know the the John's pneumatology or presentation of the spirit as I talk about is spread out over the course of the farewell discourse and it is really striking when you read that to not just to drop down into where the spirit shows up, but to look at what are Jesus words right before that and the way in which the spirit, the role of the spirit is directly, uh, directly speaking into whatever Jesus has just said. And so I think, you know, we know the spirit in John as the one who accompanies, you know, the one who is called alongside, but I think that, particularizes it even more and even, uh, you know, even, yeah, it gives it, gives it even more specificity or you're able to see, well, what does this alongsideness really look like? And so whatever then, whatever the words that Jesus has spoken, then, then the Holy Spirit is present to, uh, to respond to that, to respond to what they, what the disciples are going to need to hear, or what the disciples uh, need to know about the Holy Spirit, especially when Jesus departs. So, I love Holy Spirit this. is a first responder. That was my, that was my I, thing. I love that idea, but I love the word alongsidedness. <laughs> I, I, I love the first responder, but I I love the along uh, alongsidedness, um, and I and I also appreciate it. The um, the multiplicity of ways that um, that the spirit comes along us, which you were just referring to, but you list out here um, an aid, a comfort, an intercessor, a companion, a witness, a guide. Um, we in different points in our life 
or we as individuals who have had our own journey, just as the disciples had their own experience of Jesus, we'll need God to show up in unique ways for us. And Mm -hmm. it's important for us as community to be um, um, accepting of how others experience God and allow that to um, uh, expand who we think God is rather than putting God in a narrow box. Whether that narrow box is to say, well, I know God the Son, but I don't understand the Spirit, or I'll call God the parent, but I don't understand God the child. You, you know, in all of those ways, we're limiting God. And one of the ways maybe to really get the fullness of what Pentecost Sunday does for us is to say, if I sit next to someone whose experience and expression of the Spirit is different, what can I learn from them about God and therefore about how I'm to be a reflection of God? I like that. I mean, I think we sometimes take this language of truth that we see here and and just assume that that means the Spirit's going to communicate to each person exactly the same way, Mm -hmm. communicate the exact same message, right? That we have a sense of there's a unity or a uniformity about the Spirit and this message and this truth, capital T, that somehow has to be. And so we get into these fights about everything (laughs) without recognizing the way truth, just as we see (laughs) in Jesus, the way the truth and the life interacts with people in different ways, right? And and influences people in different ways. Uh, That the ways we try to say, well, we'll know it's the spirit when we're unanimous, or we'll know it's the spirit when everybody, you know, believes what I believe or something like that is just unrealistic and maybe not theologically on, on, uh, on target with John. Oh, the, the, the whole idea of what it means for us to form new community is this recognition, uh, again, going back to Acts, that they came together from different cultures. They came together from, you know, what they shared was this holiday. And what they began to share was this story of God showing up in Jesus. And that becomes the truth, the capital T truth, not an idea but a person that helps us to see in each other the image of God. Well, and the gift of God, with all the power in Acts too, uh, the the gift of God or the first act of the church is not one of domination or going out and criticizing the culture or whatever. It's communication. I think there's something similar happening in John where at least the roles of the spirit that Jesus highlights here are communicative, Mm -hmm. I think, largely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so it's about connection, building connection, sharing. Which makes sense when you think about John's Christology and yes. that that Jesus is the Word made flesh, and and so the way that, the way in which the Word is going to continue to be present and communicate is is through the Spirit, and 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 so and I also think that lifting up that connection of truth is very important because Jesus has already identified and identified himself as the truth in 146. And so it's not accidental, I don't think, on the part of John to <laughs> say the spirit of truth, who is, and especially when when the first introduction of the spirit in the gospel of John is Jesus saying, I'm sending you another advocate. Uh, and so there, that interchangeability of of truth and at the advocate and spirit in Jesus is, is really important for John's pneumatology. The God who has never left you, who took on flesh to walk with you, is promising to come to you in yet another way. Mm-hmm. If, if that doesn't say we belong, I don't, we yeah. in all of our diversity belong. I don't know what does. Are there ways to, this is maybe an unfair question to ask in the middle of a podcast, are there ways to communicate what we get in verse 13, where it says the spirit, he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears. I mean, for me, that's an expression, if I'm reading that right, that's an expression of the spirit's own locatedness within Christ or within the Godhead Mm -hmm. to throw in 
some foreign language to John. I mean, is that fair to say that it's not at the, in a sense, the spirit still bears witness to this intimacy that yes. the father and the son yeah. share? Yeah, absolutely. So, so it's still in a sense, kind of a mouthpiece for Jesus. I don't like that language either, but that's. Mm -hmm. Witness. A testifier. Testifier. I mean, that's, that's, that's what the, that's what the spirit does. But um, not from a distance, not one who sees something and tells it, right? Oh, no, right. no, which is the same thing. And that's, I think that's a subtle uh, theme then throughout the farewell discourse is this is this is essentially what then the disciples are asked to will be asked to do from their intimate location of right. of their relationship with Jesus will also then be witnesses and so the spirit becomes almost like a model of that hmm. for them and, yeah. and this being Pentecost Sunday uh, going back to Acts Matt. Um, they were gathered together. <laughs> they were gathered together in one place. But what is going to happen is they're going to start in Jerusalem. They're going to go into their neighborings, Samaria, and then into the utmost places of the world. So that this this um, witnessing, this testifying, this uh, uh, this recognition of God with us is going to go beyond the zip code that we're familiar with. And that can only happen if um, we in our diversity are uh, have authenticity to the cultures and communities from which we come. Which is why it's so amazing they all speak the languages of other places. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, all right, and we should go to Psalm 104. Not, it's not over, it's not over. Um, I can't remember what the word was. I wanted to repeat you, but it's not over against its communication. Yeah, domination, how those kind domination, of displays right. of power. Okay, I was trying to uh, be, be, do an alliteration. Um, That's right. Turning, turning towards Psalms, um, that uh, I probably should have hinted at that when I was saying, where does God show up in that undeniable way? Because it, it, this particular Psalm describes... Um, the glory of God, the works of God, the presence of God in, in to use the text, a manifold way uh, where what, when God shows up, um, it's, it's awesome. It's, you know, we don't talk about Leviathan. I always have to pause to say that word. Um, but th that's, a, that's an incredible creature. Um, and um, th we're not talking about a fisherman's boat here. We're talking about ships. Um, we're talking about the grandness of God um, that um, takes away their breath. That it is, you know, one way to think of death and dying is end. But another way is to take that, and I'm playing with the words here, but the awe of, you know, that, that, that psalm captures some of that for me. Um, and, and so when God's spirit is sent forth, we are renewed in that awesomeness of the glory of God. Yeah. And I think too, you know, this is, this is another direction, right, that the preacher could take in focusing on the psalm where you where you see the expression uh, the, of the spirit as as a, a fundamentally a creator right or an extension of god's creation uh god giving life and death to uh it, it, to things and to uh that that role as creator and so that that takes that that could take a sermon in another um, another direction of of where is it that uh, that we see God's work or God's presence uh, in the Spirit in those in those creative um, creative spaces? Mm -hmm. I think is um, I think is another I, I could be really you know meaningful for people to uh, to to see that. I want to make sure Romans eight gets some time, even though we're probably running late because it's just such a great passage. Yeah. Uh, and different dimensions too. Here's the spirit as, as a co-sufferer, right? Mm -hmm. as, as one that accompanies and 
and and advocates in a different kind of way and is deeply connected or enmeshed in all that it is about being human that means struggle. Mm-hmm. And so just to talk some and, about that. Yeah, Joy. Um I I highlighted and just wanted to to pay attention to uh uh the second part of uh of, of verse 24. Um, now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what is seen. Um, and I recently re- was in a conversation where I was reminded of the not yetness and that not yetness, uh, I think as you've highlighted, Matt, is the suffering that we're in that, 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 uh, um, Romans is saying that the very creation is groaning in longing for, um, and yet, um, hope is from what we glimpsed, whether it is a promise that we've never seen or whether it's something that looks like a promise that we hope we will see uh, more of, that we will experience a fullness of. And, and so I don't want that verse to uh, cause us to... Um, dare I say, glory in our sufferings. Uh, I think I've heard you, Matt, say this something about this before, um, that we don't make this not yetness, uh, okay, I'm suffering for Christ, but, but rather we make this uh, a, a step along the journey where we know the destination is something better than the brokenness that we are in right now. And from that, I find my hope. And I think too the where you get the that presence of the spirit in in those moments of suffering. For me, okay, I'm going to connect it back to John, but it's uh, oh, wow. verse 12 in 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 chapter 16. I have many other things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can't bear them now, and so that's that's in part what the Holy Spirit does is bear us up in the present and then will be present with us in those times when we think we can't.